Welcome to the 2015 NASA Ames Summer Series. Throughout history, we have looked around us, both here on Earth and out in the universe, to start understanding where we are, where we came from, and where we're going. The more we have explored, the more we have learned about ourselves. Today's seminar, entitled A Cosmic End, from the Earth to the Universe will be presented by Father Dr. Jose Funes. He is the director of the Vatican Observatory uh, and uh, received degrees, both a bachelor's degree in philosophy from the University of Del Salvador in Argentina, followed by a bachelor's degree in theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. He has also received a, degrees in, a master's degree in astronomy from the Universidad Nacional de Cordoba in Argentina and a doctorate from the University of Padua in, in Italy. He joined the Vatican Observatory in 2000 and in 2006 became the director of the observatory. He has led, conducted, and worked with numerous conferences and research meetings. He has many scientific publications and is continuously working both on research and leading the Vatican Observatory. Please join me in welcoming Father Dr. Jose Funes. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Cohen, for this very nice presentation. And thank you for the in inviting me to be here. It's a real pleasure to be with you this morning. And I also would like to thank Monica Ever for arranging all the details for the, for the talk. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to, to tell you uh, one thing before telling a story. You already realized that. This is what I, I used to tell my students when I used to teach an introductory course in astronomy at the University of Arizona. The greatest challenge you will face in my class, it is not math, not physics, it is my accent. So <laughs> I have a strong Spanish Argentinian accent. I will try to do my best. So. Uh, but this is what is important I wanted to say. Uh, when I was a, a kid, about 12 years old, in Argentina, in Cordoba, that's the time when kids start to think about uh, becoming astronomer, archaeologist, geologist, etc. So I was uh, inspired by NASA. I was the uh, golden age of the exploration of space. And a classmate passed to me a list with the addresses of all NASA centers. So uh, with my very rough English, I haven't made much progress, but uh, I wrote the letter and I asked my father to type that letter and I sent it to one of the NASA centers asking for material. So they sent me materials about the Apollo mission, uh, other uh, uh, NASA missions, and at the end, it says, if you want to receive more material, send this money to this address. <laughs> we were poor in Argentina. I still, we are poor. So I didn't have the money, the dollars, to send it to, Masa, to NASA. So I tried a different center. <laughs> <NASA's net. laughs> you know, when you, are, you don't have many resources, you have to be creative. So at the end, I got a, a lot of material from NASA. And I remember uh, always uh, looking forward the, the postman to uh, bring the, the mail to my house. And I remember these uh, brown packages coming from NASA. So um, I am inspired by your work. And I hope, this is my wish for NASA and people working in, at NASA, that uh, you continue to inspire next generations. So, uh, Let's see what inspired me for this talk. 
As a director of the Vatican uh, Observatory, I'm a member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. And I more or less I presented this uh, talk in that meeting. And there was something that caught my attention in the booklet, and it said, uh, human curiosity is the driving force for scientific development, in which belief systems and philosophies still have their valid place. So curiosity is the driving force for our research, uh, for this talk, and also for curiosity. I couldn't, not thinking curiosity. And of course, this is a sh selfie. <laughs> uh, also, uh, in the address Pope Francis uh, gave uh, to the academicians, he said, to the scientists, and especially to the Christian sci scientists, corresponds the attitude to examine the future of hum humanity and the earth, and uh, I would add, and the universe. And we have seen these days this concern of the Pope for the future of the earth with the recent document, pa paper document encyclical. So before entering into this subject, I would like to, if I can, the, the one million dollar answer. Question, sorry. This is, you can give me later one dollar million to, for the answer. So why the Vatican is interested in astronomy? And the short answer is who knows. Uh, but I, I need to tell you a story, otherwise it's difficult to explain uh, why the, the Vatican is interested in astronomy. Uh, here uh, we have these popes. This is Pope uh, Gregory XIII, who reformed the, the calendar that we use today. Uh, this is uh, Pope um, Leo XIII, who in 1891 founded the Vatican Observatory. Um, this is Pope Pius XI. With him, the observatory moved from the Vatican to Castel Gandolfo. This is the papal residence uh, for the summer. Uh, in 2009, we moved from the, the palace of the Pope. That used to be my office. <laughs> it was very nice. <laughs> but we had a wonderful uh, residence now and headquarters. Here it is. You see the gardens. And because the history of the, uh, the Vatican Observatory is similar to the history of other observatories around the world, we escaped to Arizona looking for dark skies. So in the 80s, the, the Vatican, a group of Jesuits from the Vatican Observatory arrived to Tucson, and we have a very good collaboration with the University of Arizona. This is the Department of Astronomy, Stuart Observatory, and this is the, the, the Vatican telescope on Mount Graham. This is uh, Pope Benedict uh, holding a meteorite from Mars, and the Osservatore Romano, the Vatican newspaper, published this picture on the first page of the newspaper with this headline, Mars in the hands of the Pope. <laughs> uh, this is my desk, the desk of the director, and here it is Pope uh, Benedict sign, and I explained to him that here, there is the signatures, maybe this is a unique document, the signatures of all popes since Pius XI to John Paul II. And I am telling him that with uh, his signature and with the blessing of the new facilities, the Vatican Observatory is starting a new stage in, in the history of the observatory. Just a clarification. This is not a Vatican check. I'm not asking the Pope to sign <laughs> a check for me. So this is our place, as you see, it's very nice. The U Jesuits used to say, si ortum cum biblioteca bebis nil de erit. If you have a garden with a library, there is nothing you will lack. So we have a wonderful garden and a wonderful library with antique books too. So uh, as Pope Benedict said to the participants of a colloquium we organized for the International Year of Astronomy, he said that, as you know, the history of the observatory is in every, is a, a very real way linked to the figure of Galileo. 
the controversies which surrounded his research and the church's attempt to attain a correct and fruitful understanding of the relationship between science and religion. In few words, thanks to Galileo, I'm here. And thanks to Galileo, the Vatican Observatory uh, contributes a little bit to the research in the world. Uh, among our precious things, our little treasure, we have this astrolabe from the 16th century. And we have also, this is one example of the antique books. This is uh, from Father, he was a Jesuit, Giovanni Battista Riccioli. Uh, his, this book is from 1651, and you see two systems are weighted. This is the Copernican, the, um, Copernican system and the Tycho Brahe system. And the picture show at the time for the Jesuits, at least for this Jesuit, the Tycho Brahe was heavier. Uh, it, it had better foundation. Just a curious curiosity. What is our mission? Um, as our colleagues, our deepest desire is to be on the frontier of astronomical research. And we try to address these questions as you do too. Are we alone in the universe? Are there other Earth? How do stars and planets form and evolve? How do galaxies form and evolve? What is dark matter and dark energy? What do we, do, what do we know about the universe in a, its first instance? Are there many universes? So these are some of the questions that uh, inspires us. We also have a a lab of meteorites. We have about 1,000 pieces. And this is the, the Martian meteorite that the Pope was holding in his hands. The, there is also in the Vatican the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. Uh, and in 2009, we organized a meeting on astrobiology that uh, had a good impact. Um, this is a I like very much this quotation. I, I'm not going to read it all. But um, Cardinal Laiolo, uh, he was the head of the Vatican State at the time. He said that about the astrobiology. Uh, he, this task, the task of uh, searching life and intelligent life, demands scientific integrity and an intense and indispensable case of the vast multidisciplinary research. Uh, for those of you, you know better than me that astrobiology requires uh, to be an expert in many fields, which is something that is very difficult. Um, he continues, in research, the scientists must also be allowed the possibility to walk paths which don't, do not always lead to the positive results. Sometimes our research uh, we don't arrive to results. And the community, our countries, should allow us the possibility even to fail in, in our research, in our projects. Uh, not always uh, we may have a, a result. Uh, I remember when I, I was doing my PhD in astronomy in Padua, in my community, I was living with other Jesuits. Uh, I was the only astronomer, the only one doing research. And almost every day, they would ask me, what did you discover today? <laughs> and it's not always easy to answer that question. Uh, this meeting has um, had a, a lot of impact in the, in the media at the time. You see the Washington Post, Time, New ABC News. Uh, USA Today, uh, ED from Rome, Vatican looks for signs of alien life. What is important, uh, al uh, beyond these um, uh, headlines, is that the, the Vatican uh, is encouraging uh, cutting edge research uh, because astro astrobiology, we already we have that this discipline for 20 years or so. Uh, it's an important science, an important research. And the Vatican organizing and hosting this kind of meeting is considering this an important part of science. Uh, 
one important, very important activity we have at the Vatican Observatory are our summer schools. Uh, we have uh, every two years students, grad students coming from all over the world, literally. In the last summer school, we have 25 students from 22 countries. There you see the, the audience we had with Pope Benedict. And the next summer school uh, will be next year on water in the solar system and beyond. So if you are a student or you know students, of course, uh, encourage them to apply for the school. It's a great experience. Uh, with John Paul II, the observatory had a great impulse in studies that not only involved science, but also philosophy and theology. So let's go to the, the talk and let's, uh, the universe, let's quote the universe. In the beginning is my end. In fact, it's not the universe. It is uh, T.S. Eliot. Uh, or, or better, is the universe <laughs> talking through T.S. Eliot. Uh, in the initial cons conditions of the universe, there and somehow is determined the end. Um, so these are the questions that humanity uh, have has posed a long centuries. Where are we? Where do, did we come from? Where are we going? Uh, and fortunately, scientists are not the only ones to raise those questions. This is, I'm not an expert in, in arts and fine arts, but the, this is a painting by Paul Gauguin and with this title, where are we? Where did we come from? Where are we going? So there are different approaches to the beginning and to the end of the universe. Science is just one of them. So as scientists, our starting point is the observed universe. We can only think the past and the future of the universe from its present and from the data we have collected and interpreted. We test our ideas with a reality check. I won't discuss in this uh, presentation any biological evolution or technical development because it exceeds my, my knowledge. So I would like to say that um, we are a species with long eyes and Galileo Galilei is our forefather. Uh, we use telescopes uh, to reach uh, where our eyes can do not allow us to, to see. Uh, in Arizona, uh, for you of course know Kid Peak, the National Observatory, there was a, a treat between the US government and the Todohona Odam tribe. And the Todohona, Todohona Odam tribe, they don't have a word for astronomers. So they use these uh, words the people with long eyes. We are people with long eyes and telescopes are part somehow of ourselves. And with the data that we collect from the telescope, we can try to understand the beginning and the end of the universe. So what we know is that um, there, are, there is experimental data confirming the Big Bang. Briefly, uh, we know the expansion of the universe, uh, the Hubble's law, the cosmic background radiation, and we know also that the Big Bang theory cor correctly predicts the cosmic abundance of hydrogen, helium, and other light elements. Uh, we also know that this universe is accelerating in, the, in its expansion, and the Nobel Prize was given in 2009 for this discovery to Sol Permuter, Brian Smith, and Adam Rees. So we know that um, the after uh, the data from Planck, uh, that the age of the universe is uh, about 30.8 million years, and that uh, the universe is made of basically dark matter, about 70%. Uh, Baryonic matter, normal matter, just to say, about 5%, and dark energy, about uh, 68%. We, 
we know that the universe is uh, expanding and it's accelerating. And this is, if we know that this is the present of the universe, this is what we can observe. These are, there are different possibilities for the past and for the future of the universe. From the data we have collected, we know that we live in an accelerating universe and in the oldest possibility scenario according to the data we know. I like to compare uh, the age of the universe with other time scales for the, for the rest of the, of the talk. So uh, one cosmic year uh, is equal uh, for the sake of this presentation to 14 billion solar years. What do we can say about the, our future? Of course, the predictions will depend on the time scale that we use. Let's talk about the, a little bit of Earth, even uh, it's not my field. Uh, it is, well, it is very challenging to make any prediction for the future. And particularly to regarding to the Earth, there are four geological processes that determine the shape of the surface of the Earth, the impact, uh, the cratering, the volcanism, tectonics, and erosion. We need also to take into consideration the, into account the change in the atmosphere and the oceans and the dynamical evolution of the Earth-Moon system. So things are very complex. Just in, in one slide, I am resuming, hopefully, uh, about 14 billion years of story or more in 50 minutes. <laughs> so you will forgive me if I miss something or I don't give enough details. But sometimes it's good to have a whole picture, a big picture. The image of the Earth in 3 billion years, about 0.2 cosmic years, is of a declining world. In 8 billion years, 0.6 cosmic year, the Sun will become a red giant expanding to the present orbit of the Earth. The Sun will span, uh, that expands will spell a considerable part of its mass into space. And when the Sun expands to the current orbit of the Earth, the Earth itself will have moved to almost twice its current distance from the Sun. Another thing that we need to take into account is uh, the threat of near-Earth objects uh, that might hit the Earth. And this is uh, just a plot where you have the, the frequency for impacts and the size of the impactor. The craters are 10 times larger. And you see uh, how often we may get these events on Earth. Just a recall of what happened recently in Russia. Um, so this is, we have records that these things really happen. And this is a simulation from ESA. Um, for you may remember uh, in What happened when the Levi Shoemaker comet in different fragments hit the Jupiter? So I'm, uh, I'm sure you know all these images are very well known to you. So what, what we can say about the solar neighborhood? Uh, a nearby star could pass by about three light years from the sun. Uh, this event could happen every 100,000 years. The sun also, another possibility is that likely is going to encounter a molecular cloud, maybe once or twice in one billion years. And the gravitational pull would cause a shower of comets that would result, may well increase the impact rate for these comets. Supernova threat. Uh, we also may suffer 
uh, if we are still here, uh, that the supernova occurs within 100, 200 light years from the sun every 100 or 200 uh, million years. This is uh, likely to have a notable effect on the solar system. Our galaxy, um, we know that galaxies are uh, composed by gas, dust, uh, stars, and dark matter. In galaxies, we have a rotation one galactic, we can say that one galactic year is about 0 0.01 cosmic year, and we have this uh, cycling of stars, uh, gas, and dust that occurs uh, within the, our galaxy. We know that galaxies uh, also form cluster of galaxies, uh, and they, they form and evolve, and we know that uh, from galaxy evolution that there are two time scales in the evolution of galaxies. Galaxies uh, are tracer of the cosmic evolution in the last 13 billion years, and uh, there are like two clocks uh, shaping galaxies. There we have time or redshift res here and the looking, time, looking back time here. Uh, this is the time of the, cosmic, the clock of cosmic evolution for the whole universe. And then we have uh, the time that is, the clock uh, that is given us, the, the, the stellar time related to the evolution of stars. For a, a star with a one solar mass like our sun, this is, the, the span life for the stars. When the, the stars become more massive, they, they live uh, shorter lives. This diagram from Carmody and Kennicott uh, show us different factors that intervene in the formation and evolution of galaxies. Uh, you have here internal processes on this side, and on the right side, uh, you have external processes. So inside the galaxy, uh, you have star formation, gas recycling, uh, and the supernova production. Or, and then on the here, you have also interaction with other galaxies through mergers, for example. Uh, on the top, uh, you have fast processes, and on the bottom, you have uh, uh, lower proce uh, low processes. Um, you have the collapse of gas that will form the, the galaxy, and then you have very long-term processes, uh, what we call a secular evolution, that. Uh, is driven by bars, um, dark matter, and other things in, in the galaxy. So in this uh, video, it shows in the time of a, of a cosmic year, about 14 billion years, the evolution and formation and transformation of, of galaxies. So this is what happened in about one cosmic year. I think you know the story, so. The other thing that we know um, is the star formation history of the universe. Uh, here, again, uh, you have the star formation rate in the universe versus time. This is the present of the universe. Uh, so in the future, the, the universe will form less and less stars. The universe was uh, very much effective in forming stars between one and three uh, billion years from the present. 
uh, with uh, Robert Koenig at some years ago in a, in a team, we study, try to study the, the star formation in the local universe because at the time this wasn't a very well-known part of the diagram. We tried to add some points here. So uh, what is going to happen with galaxies? In about 10 to 100 years or 10 to 90 cosmic years, galaxies will fade into the darkness. Cluster of galaxies will become cluster of black holes. Finally, black holes will evaporate. In the very distant future, the universe eventually will be, will be shredded, what is called the Big Rip. The universe could not have a single final end, but a multiple ends. Uh, the universe is going to toward a final state of cold and darkness, thermal death, which says that the universe will go toward a state of maximum entropy, what is called the Big Freeze. The long-term scenario, with, ev with everything in the universe dying gradually, will be obviously hostile to life. This is not a very promising future for us, I guess. <laughs> Using, again, the words of the poet, this is the way of the, the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. T.S. Eliot. So at this point, this is until here, more or less, uh, what we can say about from the scientific point of view. You can correct me in many things, uh, but it's, it's very difficult to say what is going to be the, the Earth, the, the Sun, our galaxy, and the, the universe as a whole. The beginning of uh, this seminar was like a going into a flight with all these indications, and I hope we are going to have a safe landing <laughs> after this talk. But uh, this has been a scientific uh, voyage to the end of the universe, but it is also a spiritual journal, a journey to the final frontier of our uh, existential frontier. I, I am final frontier, I'm, I'm sure you already had the background, it's Star Trek, no? It's <laughs> I'm a Star Trek fan. And so, uh, emptiness and questions. At this point of my talk, when I prepared this talk, I, I would say that it was also a spiritual experience to prepare this talk. Because uh, somehow, I think the, um, Fritz Nietzsche here summarized quite well what was my, my feelings. Uh, when you look long into the abyss, could be the, this empty universe, the abyss, the abyss looks into you. Or put in, in the words of the Bible, a vast emptiness, Coelho says, an immense void, everything is empty. So, is this the last word? I don't know. And just as we are used, maybe we have some kind of uh, second episode. Um, I would like to say what might happen, perhaps with life. Life is resilient. Uh, we have many proofs of that. Uh, we have proof, you know better than me, uh, in the extreme files that are able to live in very hard conditions for life. Uh, we see sometimes uh, flowers in places that we don't expect to see them. And this is uh, the gardens in the papal summer gardens in Castel Gandolfo. This used to be the house of the emperor, Domitian, who built the, his villa there. Um, and, you know, not many years ago, only about 2,000 years ago, 
people used to live here. Nobody is there living right there, but there are so many trees that are living in, in these stones. I would like to say a word uh, about astrobiology from a different point of view. I think uh, for you, I hope, it's going to be new. And this is from a Jesuit, Father Angelo Secchia. I'm going to say in a second who he was. He wrote this uh, in the late uh, 1800. What to think of this star without any doubt similar to, to our sun? I would say that's astrophysics. This time, like the sun, to keep alive an enormous quantity of creatures of every kind, biology. Those immense regions must be, must be inhabited by intelligent beings, and though with reason, capable to know, love, and honor the Creator. And perhaps these inhabitants of the stars are more faithful than us to the duties of acknowledgement towards who draw them from nothing. We want to hope that among them there were not those unlucky that in their pride denied the existence of the Creator. And I would say that theology fiction, because uh, he's speculating. We don't know that. We need uh, a first proof. So who was Father Sec? He, uh, he was an Italian astronomer, a Jesuit. He was the director of the observatory of the Roman College, which today is the Gregorian University. He was one of the pioneers in astronomical spectroscopy and was one of the first scientists to state that the sun was a star. He collected uh, 4,000 stellar, stellar spectrograms, developed the first system of stellar cl classification, and discovered ca carbon stars. And I, I also would like to quote uh, Martin Rees uh, about our position in, in, the, in, in the cosmos today. The wider cosmos has a potential feature that could even be infinite. But will these vast expanses of time be filled with life, or as empty as the Earth, first sterile seas? The choice may depend on us this century. The most crucial location in space and time, apart from the Big Bang itself, could be here and now. I have some questions. If our location in the universe is crucial for life, all life will end with Earth. Is life a common phenomenon? What will happen with the life in trillions and trillions of years when the universe fades? Is there other universes? Will life survive in those places? Is there any other questions? An incomplete uh, thought. I'm quoting here a Pope Francis giving an address to the professor of theology and philosophy at the Gregorian University. The theologian who is satisfied with, this, with his complete and conclusive thought is mediocre. The good theologian and philosopher has an open, that is, an incomplete thought, always open to the mayors of God and of the truth, always in development. And I would uh, change a little bit the wording, and I would say um, the scientist who is satisfied with uh, his or her complete and conclusive thought is mediocre. The good scientist has an open, that is, an incomplete thought, always open to the mayors of the truth, always in development. And to conclude, I would like to end with um, incomplete matters, and then we can talk about this. We do not agree about the origin and the definition of life, an intelligent life. We do not know how to define a civilization. We don't, we don't know about dark matter and dark energy. We are still missing a theory of everything that may combine general relativity and quantum mechanics and the standard model. And of course, the list is incomplete. 
and this presentation is incomplete. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for a few questions. If you have a question, please stand up, go to the middle aisle, there's a microphone, stand there, be succinct with your question, and move away from the microphone. So let me ask a question until someone gets the energy to move uh, up and ask. Uh, I actually think and I concur with the point of looking out there for uh, learning more about ourselves. Um, is there any parts of the Vatican Observatory that looks at life, life in terms of us going and exploring other planets and how that sits within that arena? That is a good question, and I, I would like to say that um, the observatory is a small group uh, with employees and uh, scientists, religious personnel. We are not more than around 20 people. So uh, if we play for a moment, I don't know, the passing from the cosmic years of NASA to the <laughs> our few numbers at the Vatican Observatory, the, the difference is huge. Uh, however, uh, the Vatican Observatory considers that the, the search of life in the universe is uh, an important thing. Uh, in 2005, the observatory organized, Father Cohen at the time was the director, organized a, s a summer school on astrobiology in 2007, uh, we organized a meeting on a, a school, again, on extrasolar planets and brown dwarfs. Uh, in 2009, we organized this um, um, workshop study week, as it is called at the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. And the next um, school, as I said, will be on water in the solar system and beyond. So this is to say that though we are not uh, strictly involved in the search of life in the universe, we don't have a, a lab for, for that or the resources, uh, we collaborate and we bring together uh, scientists, students that um, uh, are experts in the field and that they can help us to understand better the search of life in the universe. Uh, it's a, what I have to say that uh, my training, scientific training was in galaxies, nearby galaxies. But becoming director of the observatory, you realize that there is something else out there than, rather than galaxies and uh, you pay attention to other important topics. This is, uh, I think, one important topic not only for science, but also from, for a uh, philosophical and religious approach. Uh, we can learn a lot, even from, from the search itself, even we don't arrive to positive results. Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, one of the things I wondered about uh, was you have probably a time allocation committee for the time on your telescopes and you'll have some priority for what observations are made with that telescope. Could you tell us what programs you emphasize with your observations and how that addresses some of the questions you brought up? We have uh, our telescope, 75% uh, is Vatican telescope and 25% uh, in the, um, it belongs to the University of Arizona. The programs, uh, we have, I would say, uh, quite a strong group on in solar system. I consider them uh, brother uh, Bob Mackey and brother Guy Consolmagno, that you may know him, uh, doing research with meteorites. Um, and also we have Father Kikwaya from Congo, 
who is using our telescope and other telescopes and other cameras for the, the search of near-Earth objects. Um, we also study the near, um, near, nearby stars that are similar to our sun, and this is related to the search of somehow the, uh, the search of life in the universe. Father Corvalli uh, does this kind of research. Uh, um, also, I've been using the telescope for uh, formation, star formation in nearby galaxies. We have, uh, this is for the use of the telescope. Um, of course, you need other telescope to address uh, uh, those questions, but from the theoretical point of view also, uh, we have uh, Father John T, an Italian, who is studying, uh, doing research on string theory and quantum gravity, just to show you that there is the other side of our research. Again, we do not cover uh, all the, the fields. We try to be as much as we can uh, involved in the research with our colleagues, and we have several collaborations. And the scientific meetings that we have organized and the schools is always a way to learn from our colleagues. Uh, we learn a lot from organizing these things and sharing uh, their research interest. I, I see that your talk shows that the Vatican Observatory uh, has potentially a very long planning horizon in terms of thinking about the future. And I wonder if the Vatican Observatory has uh, considered uh, a time in the future when you would move uh, into space telescopes for observation, uh, and if you have given any thought possibility to um, uh, promoting or, or, uh, or sponsoring some form of space telescope. Thank you. Um, before I forget, uh, we have a website that is uh, in progress. Uh, we have uh, renewed the, the website. But if you go to the home page, you can download, if you have some, pro I don't think so, but if you need some kind of um, sleeping aid, you can download. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, it's very interesting, <laughs> I should say. Uh, you have the annual report of the Vatican Observatory. It's very simple, vaticanobservatory.va, or you do Google Vatican Observatory, and uh, there we have a document for the, with the scientific priorities for the 10 years, next 10 years of the observatory. Of course, uh, we are small. Uh, we are not trying to compete with, with NASA or with the European agency. But we try to, in, within our possibilities, to be involved in, in science. Regarding the, the question about uh, how to move to the next step of telescopes, I have addressed these questions with uh, our staff uh, when we prepare also that document. And at the moment, uh, it looks like it's very difficult uh, to have a for us, a 20 meter telescope, a 30 meter telescope. Uh, though through the universe, with a good collaboration with the University of Arizona, we may have access to those telescopes if we need them for the research. What we are doing now, uh, and this is in progress, there is a plan for a network of small telescope, two meter telescope in southern Arizona. And this network is going to be robotized uh, and we are doing this. Our telescope is being robotized. Uh, hopefully, in about a year, will be done. And we are doing this in collaboration with the University of Arizona. So this is, according to our possibilities, the way to keep the telescope updated and to address questions that may require space telescopes and other big telescopes. I've been collaborating with a team with a lead by the Rob Kenica, then we use uh, Hubble, um, Galax, and Spitzer. So we have access somehow to the data that this telescope provides.
Hi, um, thank you so much for making the trip and uh, making the time for the presentation. I was wondering, and I, I don't know if this is beyond the scope of the talk, I was wondering what you think the theological implications of discovering life would be. Um, I don't know how else to phrase the question. Does it, does it broaden it? Does it make it more magical? I would just, if you could spend just a couple of minutes talking about your personal view, that would be great. Thanks. Once I, sometimes I, I, I give interviews to journalists and when, once one journalist asked me the, the following question. Who would be the first people, per, per person, that you communicate if you find that there is a life in the universe? To the Pope, he said, and I said to my mom. <laughs> 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 Being serious now. Um, I was at first, we need, we need to make sure that we have discovered life and that this life, I think, I'm talking, I am someone that is not working in the field, but I think we need to be very careful that the life, if we uh, find life, that this life has not be, been imported by us before. Uh, that would be a, a in any case, a great discovery to find life, even a very primitive form of life. Second, if the, there is intelligent life. I would like to say that it is already difficult to find intelligent life on Earth. We can, <laughs> we can imagine to find intelligent life in the universe. Um, just a, a joke, don't take, too, don't take me too serious. Uh, but I, I, it's a very interesting question, and I think we, I'm working on that. I have some thoughts. Uh, we need to approach the possibility of discovering life from different points of view. Uh, the science point of view, of course, is important, but also from a philosophical or theological point of view. In my slides, I said uh, something like, uh, we don't know, we don't, I think, uh, you can correct me, uh, we don't agree in what is life, uh, how to define life. If we find life, uh, what, what, what are we searching for? And the other point is that, uh, what, and this would be the debate for, um, I don't want to in, uh, enter in this debate now, but uh, what is a civilization? What do we call a civilization? What criteria we use? to say this is a civilized world. I don't think that we can agree even on that today. And in the search of life itself, um, we can learn many things about our, ourselves and our origins. And I think there is life, maybe in the universe, and even intelligent life, but for me, in my opinion, I think it's good. It won't be very. It will be very difficult to find life, and in, maybe intelligent. Maybe we are right to find life, but to find intelligent life or that some kind of intelligent beings, it is, uh, would counter us. Um, but that's my my opinion. Hi, thanks for coming and talking to us. Um, uh, so kind of similar to the last question, we're touching on it at least. Um, I'm interested to hear uh, the, the way that religion is unique in how it makes truth claims both about the nature of the universe itself as well as how we ought to live, um, the relationship of those two things and how, for, for example, um, Galileo, you know, his discoveries affected um, you know, there were truth claims about the universe that affected uh, also what religion had to say about how we ought to live. Um, so aside from, you know, whether or not there uh, exists life on other planets, uh, the, the different things that you're studying, the questions that you're pursuing, um, what are some areas that you see uh, that these 
unanswered questions could possibly have the greatest change in what the Catholic Church says about how we ought to live. Thank you. Well, one second intention of my talk was just to address this kind of concerns or questions or, or thoughts. How good uh, science and religion could they interact? Um, I'm learning, uh, and I think it's Galileo was a very important event for the history of the Catholic Church, of course, but for the West Western culture, the way we understand the relationship between science and religion. And religion. I don't think that, um, this, again, this is my personal opinion, the discovery of life, of intelligent life, with, uh, would have a, a great impact in the Catholic faith or the Christian faith. Uh, I think we have a, sorry to do some kind of advertising, but uh, I'm still reading it. This, uh, because uh, it was published last week and I was traveling, uh, I started to, to read the encyclical by Pope Francis, on the, on, I'm reading it in Spanish, so uh, on the concern, I, I would say, of the common house or common home, he used that terms, those terms. Um, I think it's new in the approach he has to the, this problem, because it's not, he considered the results coming from science, but also he considered other perspectives from the economic point of view, from ethical point of view, um, from a religious point of view, but it's quite universal. Not he, he's trying to reach not only Catholic, but everyone on, on the third. I think there we have a good example, a good model in the way that uh, science, uh, philosophers, or even people working in, oh, in culture, with anthropologists, for example, and religious from different confessions, Christians, Jewish, Muslims. I think we need to move in that way. For me, one kind of thing that I'm learning in this last year is that it's important the dialogue between science and religion but not only in the context of the Catholic Church, in the context of Galileo, uh, but also in the context uh, with the, in the dialogue with other religions. Uh, I don't know, but in Europe, this is my impression. I don't know much here in the US, but uh, the interreligious dialogue is urgent. It's urgent, and maybe science could be a helpful language to uh, help to understand people from different religions. So that's my hope. I guess, <clears throat> I guess I'm the final question. Um, it's obvious when we talk you have a great command of uh, astronomical data, and I know from your background you believe the Bible and the stories that are obtained therein. I guess what I want to know was in the book of Revelation, uh, the end of the earth is predicted and also the creation of a new earth. And I was hoping coming into this talk that you would, you would speak to that being well footed in both those. Do you have any comments on that that you could share briefly? Okay, yes. I have to confess that uh, I had one extra slide addressing your question, but because I didn't want to make a, a direct reference to, to the Bible uh, regarding this. This is a question that requires a long answer. I'm, I'm going to try to be short. I am short. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Bible, this is for Catholics, so the mainstream Catholics. Um, I would say for the church, uh, for the authority of the church. 
the Bible is not a book of science. I repeat, the Bible is not a book of science. If we have uh, scientific questions, we shouldn't search the answers in the Bible. What is the Bible? The Bible is the book that we believe. I believe in God. Eh? I am a scientist, but I believe in God. Um, the Bible is a book inspired by God, written by men and women, I don't know, I, uh, that was written with a language that we was used sometimes 3,000 years ago. Um, the the uh, sacred authors, they didn't know anything about the theory of the relativity of uh, quantum physics. They didn't, they wanted to answer the big questions that we have, those questions that uh, I put it in, in the past. Uh, I would say this, I would use this image. Now people don't write anymore love letters. They send emails, maybe all people, maybe still, or SMS or a message or iMessage or WhatsApp. Uh, but uh, <laughs> maybe today God could speak uh, using WhatsApp or Twitter, I don't know. But in, I would say, uh, the Bible is the love, the letter of love that he or she has sent to his people, to us, with a language that is a language of 3,000, 2,000 years ago. How is it that? The book of Revelation, uh, the, the meaning, uh, this is my understanding, it's not a, about the end, how the universe will end in the sense of the, what would happen to galaxies, to stars. But this, it gives us the sense, the meaning of human history. Where are we going? It was written in a time, maybe similar to our time, uh, in which Christians were persecuted. So uh, St. John, the, um, he's trying to give hope a message of hope to this community that is suffering from persecution. And what we're saying is that uh, God is conducting this human history with all difficulties and with all problems we see. And that the profound fundaments of this history, human history, and why not history of the universe, are in the hands of God. This is very difficult to explain and to say using scientific language because it's a different, we need to, to read the Bible uh, with a different language. Um, so uh, I would say that for the book of Revelation. Of course, it's a very complicated book with many symbols, but uh, in a short answer, that would be my reply to you. So please join me in thanking Father Dr. Jose Funes. <laughs>